Good evening, and thank you for joining us for today's Stanton Distinguished Leader Series event with our guest, Laura Lane, UBS's Chief Corporate Affairs Officer and Co-Chair of the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa. Established by Dan and Mary Stanton, the parents of two McDonough alumni, our Stanton Series connects our Georgetown students and community with renowned leaders who share insights from their personal and professional experiences. Tonight, we welcome back alumna Laura Lane, MSFS90, for a conversation on her career and work at the intersection of business and policy. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few reminders for our hybrid event. For our in-person audience members today, based on today's news, Fresh off the press for Georgetown's public health office, there are rising cases on COVID, of COVID-19 on campus. We encourage those present to take enhanced personal hygiene measures. Laura Lane has graciously agreed to take a few questions towards the end of today's program. So should you wish to ask a question during the question and answer period, please utilize the microphone in the center of the aisle. Please join us at the outdoor reception immediately following the reception at the other side of the tent. For our guests online, if you're having any technical difficulties or wish to ask a question, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now I'm pleased to introduce Joel Hellman, Dean of the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service. Thanks everyone, good afternoon and welcome. It's great to be here. Um, it's great to be welcoming back to campus um, Laura Lane, and thank you all for coming. First, let me uh, thank most sincerely the Stanton family um, uh, for this lecture series. It's a great opportunity to bring remarkable people to campus and give you the opportunity to interact and engage with them, so I thank them deeply for that. Um, and Dean Almeida is traveling today. I know he would like to join me. I am not a replacement for Dean Almeida, despite the fact that we share um, a, a challenge, follicle challenge, I would call it. Um, but if, if Dean Almeida was here, um, both of us really would be standing here in the sense that um, I am not a stand-in for, for Paul Almeida, um, but both Paul Almeida and myself believe passionately in the critical intersection of business um, and international affairs, business and policy. And I can't think of a company that more reflects that critical intersection than UPS. And I can't think of an individual in a company um, whose career, not only in that company, but as you'll see when I introduce her, her whole career really reflects that critical intersection. And that intersection is important not only because a knowledge of international affairs makes for a better business person, which I think is already fairly well established. But I think one thing all of us are recognizing from the events most recently, the events that we're all living through now, um, is how critical the role of business is in dealing with global challenges, in dealing with global public policy problems. Um, that this isn't a question of making business more sophisticated about the world, but it's really a question of how we build a partnership between the private and public sector, between business um, and governments and NGOs to deal with the most pressing problems we're facing. And one need only think about the pandemic. One need only think about the global supply chain problems that we're having now. One need only think about climate change. UPS and how it handles um, its sort of shipping practices is going to have as big an impact on climate change as just about any government, probably more so than most governments. So if we are concerned, as we are on the Georgetown campus, about solving global problems, about coming up with innovative solutions to global problems, then we need to be thinking about how business and governments interact. We need to understand firms as well as we understand markets um, and states. Um, we need to understand finance and leadership as much as we understand politics and security. So it is um, with that um, great challenge that we're facing globally that I'm particularly pleased to welcome today Laura Lane because as I said, her career really represents everything um, that we have been trying to think about here at the school. So let me tell you a little bit about 
this remarkable um, career. Um, we like to say, start first and foremost, because I am the Dean of SFS, to say that she um, was a graduate, an alum, an MSFS, a Master's of Science and Foreign Service alum. And from there, um, she took a, just a fascinating um, career path, going from MSFS into the Foreign Service, um, where she served in Colombia, where she served in Rwanda, um, where she experienced the, the trauma of the Civil War, where she worked after on post-war and post-conflict um, reconstruction. Um, she went there into the USTR, the US Trade Representative's office, where she was played a major role in negotiating China's entry into the World Trade Organization, where she worked on major agreements on financial services, on telecoms, just critical issues that kind of shape global trade. Um, and then she went into the private sector in the area of government affairs um, and public policy. Um, and, and she worked through some of the most important firms um, uh, dealing at this intersection, Citigroup, um, Time Warner, and now since 2011 um, at UPS, um, where she has risen to the position of chief corporate affairs officer, um, where she covers a whole gamut um, of activities um, from communications and engage, go, government engagement, global policy engagement, um, to the UPS Foundation, um, and so many other areas. And she is a critical member, ultimately, of the executive leadership team. And we were saying a little bit earlier, we're very proud that of the 12 members of the UPS executive leadership team, there are a quarter of them are full of Hoyas, um, which is a wonderful thing to sort of see. So her career, she's been, she has been living um, something that we feel very passionate about. And something that Dean Almeida and I like to say is that when we created new academic programs that intersect um, business and public policy, first at the master's and executive master's level and now at the undergraduate level through our BSBGA program, it was actually following in the paths and the trails that were blazed by people like Laura Lane. So that our alums from Georgetown were doing this in their career paths. They picked up along the way, whether it was understanding of business through the many positions that you've held. In some, in some cases in, our, in business affairs, they were picking up an understanding of global affairs during the way. Now what we tried to do is translate that into a new educational program where rather than having them pick up these things along the way, we're actually training you to do that from the very start because that's what global challenges require. So it's in that spirit that we're so pleased to have um, Laura Lane here to talk about her experience, her career, um, and what she is working on now at this incredible intersection of public policy problems that we're all that's impacting all of our daily lives. So welcome, Laura. Welcome home. It's great to have you here. Thank you all for participating um, in this event, and we're really looking forward to the conversation today. And with that, um, let me bring on um, uh, Brad. Um, it's great to have you here um, uh, to sort of uh, start us all off. Brad, great. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. And Laura, thank you so much for being here. I'm jazzed to be here. So. I am <laughs> so excited uh, that you're here with us um, because, you're, as Joel said, your career just exemplifies uh, what someone, the impact, the positive impact that someone can have both for the organization they're working for, be it government or corporate, but also society. Mm -hmm. When you can successfully navigate the border between business and public policy, particularly in a global economy. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that uh, my questions will draw out uh, all that, and I'll just try to get out of the way. Okay, um, sounds good. As we were talking about before we came on, your portfolio at UPS is sizable yeah. and diverse. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the initiatives mm -hmm. that you've uh, championed mm -hmm. at UPS that, that are at this intersection. Yeah, so um, I think I actually have one of the coolest roles at UPS, and it's one that our new CEO, by the way, I'm really proud of this fact, 
first woman CEO of um, UPS in our 114 year uh, history, which is pretty darn cool. Uh, and um, she created the role that I'm currently now in as Chief Corporate Affairs Officer. And I know Joel kind of went through all the different um, responsibilities that I have. And what's brilliant, though, about this role is it um, brings together all the tools that you need if you want to advance business interests as well as advance the purpose of an organization. And so Carol Tomei, our CEO, often calls me the Chief Purpose Officer. And I love that title because it's all about how we bring to life the values that UPS has and how we advance them in the market, in the global marketplace. And so um, I actually uh, got the role uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Talk about like, uh, like an incredible <laughs> responsibility. I, I got inherited teams that I didn't even know who those people were. And I'm looking at them in Zoom, you know, on, on the Zoom screens going, OK, so what do you do? And uh, you know, I kind of felt like, who's your mother? You know what I mean? So um, uh, uh, the responsibility, though, is multifaceted. My role is to advance public policy issues, uh, as well as communicate the interests of uh, the company, as well as advance our sustainability agenda. And sustainability for our company is bigger than just the environmental questions. It is the E, the S, and the G. So for us, it's about advancing um, uh, green logistics in the environmental space. It's how we play a role um, in the S side of advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in across our workforce and within the communities that we serve. And by the way, we operate in 220 countries and territories around the world. And so that responsibility is global in nature. And the G being the governance issues. So how we act ethically, transparently in the world um, on the basis of uh, you know, good foundation, not just with respect to financial you know, reporting, but also reporting on the role that we have in the world through our supply chains, through the kind of people that we employ, um, and the kind of partnerships that we advance. And so a um, couple of the examples, uh, one near term right now, because I will be going next week to um, Glasgow for the COP26 meetings. And right now, we're in the middle of working with governments, with our suppliers, um, and with our customers on figuring out ways to be greener in the way we deliver around the world. So uh, fun facts, or not so fun facts, actually, if you operate as the company's chief sustainability officer, which is one of the hats that I wear. We emit 39 million metric tons of CO2 emission in the world. And um, that's, a, that's, that's a number that, just to put it into context for you, is the amount of the emissions of the country of Denmark. My maiden name is Larson. I'm a proud Dane. I do not want UPS to be, you know, like uh, Denmark in that respect. And so I'm constantly trying to figure out ways that I can work with our engineers as well as our customers to be able to provide them the service that they're expecting, but do it in a greener way. And it's a huge challenge, as you can imagine, because 60% of our emissions come from the air. And here's the reality. I want us to be green tomorrow. I actually want us to be green yesterday yesterday. But the reality is the technology um, limits our ability to be green in the air. Last time I checked, there haven't been any electric uh, cargo aircraft um, that are uh, in use or even you know, uh, developed yet. So all we can do is advance sustainable aviation fuel and use it in our aircraft. All we can do is work with our engineers to come up with innovations like the electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that we're now using as pilot tests within our small feeder aircraft um, network. But the reality is we're also in the middle of a pandemic. There's a big responsibility on UPS, and I hope we've delivered for everyone who's ever used our service, because we've been the reason that governments have been able to um, you know, institute some of the lockdowns and the quarantines, because they knew companies like UPS and our competitors would keep delivering, providing the supplies that, um, that people needed to be able to be safe at home, providing the PPE 
be to, you know, the front lines of law enforcement, you know, firefighters, uh, the hospital facilities, in addition to families as they had to go out and go grocery shopping. And so we've been having to do this careful balancing act of wanting to speed up the move to green, being limited by the technologies that are out there to help us take the carbon out, and yet at the same time having this increasing demand for our services. And so I'm at the intersection of those challenges right now, and it's where the public-private partnerships are so critical. Um, the work that we do with governments, like right now, today, in fact, the negotiations on Capitol Hill are under way on the infrastructure and reconciliation package. My team is in the middle of those discussions, figuring out ways we can get governments to help us speed the, um, the uh, acceleration of the use of alternative fuel vehicles in our network, figuring out ways to create the infrastructure to get sustainable aviation fuel to the 15 locations around the world where we need SAF to be able to um, uh, you know, uh, operate green uh, within our uh, air network, and um, working with them on ways to create the changes in policy so that there isn't an incentive to use diesel um, you know, uh, uh, tractor trailers or packaged cars. Because believe it or not, there's a lot of pub uh, public policy that's been written that really supports the use of diesel over alternative fuel vehicles. We're trying to show that we need to you know, take away that disincentive to, use, to using green technology. So that's just one example. Um, I can do a thousand others. I can do it on trade. I can do it on tax. I, 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 know you I can. can do it on any of them. So. I know you can. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just before we came down, you were talking about UPS's role in supporting vaccine development. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a very topical and uh, global. Yes. So maybe talk a little bit about, about interactions. What it was. You know, with governments on that, yeah. So um, a lot of people don't know. You, I hope you all love your uh, UPS driver, um, and I hope they deliver well on this campus. Um, but everybody knows this is big, big brown, right? You know the big brown trucks that deliver? Well, people don't know. We actually have blue trucks, too, and they're part of our healthcare logistics division. 15 years we've been in the business of healthcare logistics, and boy, talk about getting ready for the big game. Uh, we got the call um, uh, first in terms of our logistics efforts for uh, distribution of PPE. I don't know if you guys remember in the beginning of the pandemic, I remember it vividly because I don't <laughs> think I slept that much um, throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, getting the call from the White House saying, we got to figure out how to get more, um, you know, PPE around the world and quickly, um, and, but particularly here in the United States with the death rates rising. Um, and our health healthcare logistics team, which had all these partnerships and all these supply chains around the world um, to access PPE and to bring it quickly to the locations in need. So I don't know if you guys remember this huge spike that happened in New York City um, and the shortage of not just masks, but hand sanitizer um, or hospital gowns. Uh, UPS was in the middle of figuring out all those supply chains and in some cases standing up new supply chains. I remember working with Sri Lanka and uh, the Indian government on figuring out how to move textiles to Honduras and Guatemala to retool Gap and Haynes's uh, manufacturing facilities to create PPE faster to be able to get it into New York when it was having its massive crisis. Um, and we were involved in all of those logistics efforts. And then, of course, Operation Warp Speed, which all of you know was part of the administration's efforts to really accelerate the development of vaccines. A lot of people don't know, UPS was involved in seven of the 10 vaccine clinical trial studies. We were the ones that were moving the shipments of everything between groups of uh, volunteers that were willing to try um, you know, the, the, the different tests that were being done by Pfizer, by Moderna, by AstraZeneca. 
it was critical that we leveraged our network because if you want to accelerate you know, the, um, the utilization of the vaccine, we needed to make sure in partnership with like companies like Pfizer that they had enough of the trials happening with lots of different um, population groups. So really ensuring that the demographic you know, pool that was being sampled would yield the best outcomes so it could be the safest for the most people around the world. A lot of people didn't realize UPS was in the middle of that. Fast forward to once the, uh, the various vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna were the first two out, um, got the uh, emergency use authorizations, we were the first ones to deliver. Uh, those vaccines because we had the capabilities to move um, in a complex kind of supply chain. Because remember, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have to be kept in um, temperature controlled ways. UPS had those capabilities and said, yes, we can. We'll deliver them anywhere you want around the world. Um, we're about to, on December 11th, super proud of this, deliver 1 billion vaccines. Um, and here's the cool part. We're not just delivering them to the um, developed countries. The cool part for me is in my role, I oversee the foundation. I oversee our community relations efforts. And you obviously know I have a personal passion for Africa. We're actually, uh, we've actually been delivering vaccines to the hardest places. I said to Samantha Powers, Get, tell me where the hardest place is to deliver because the last shall be first in this case. And I'm the one who authorized the use of drones, for example, to deliver those vaccines in Malawi. We delivered them to the Ashanti region in Ghana where we had wonderful partnerships from a lot of our community engagement work to work with those community leaders so that some of the Ashanti you know, tribal leaders would say, I will be the first to get the vaccine so I can encourage the rest in my community to get the vaccine. And we've been delivering to over 100 countries around the world. Um, and um, doing it some for commercial reasons, some for humanitarian reasons, because at UPS we recognize if you know we're all not safe, no one's really safe. And so that's been a really awesome opportunity that UPS has been given to show our expertise in complicated logistics, working with governments, because by the way, Governments didn't make it easy. Um, I can tell you, um, as a trade person, we had to deal with so many different customs officials and trying to explain to them why you know, they didn't need to hold for customs clearance these you know, temperature sensitive vaccines that were moving in special containers and how they shouldn't put tariffs on those. They should speed them through. Um, it was a challenge in, you know, in, in the initial phases, but um, we finally got uh, many governments to start working with us rather than against us. So it's been kind of exciting. And yes, I am trying to now take all those learnings from the custom stuff, which you know I'm a trade geek, um, and, and say, see, it works when you're moving vaccines. Can you imagine if you make trade easier for everyone else, especially as, you know, small and medium-sized businesses? Can you imagine the economic development and economic opportunity? Um, I'm still pushing that, and I don't think the um, World Trade Organization ministerial is going to lead a lot, but I'm not giving up. So. <laughs> Great. Well, on this topic of empowering economic growth, mm -hmm. both for social change and corporate growth, mm -hmm. I know you're very passionate about gender equity. Yes. And this is an area where you've done a lot of work, yeah. and you balance the, the business case with the social change yes. case. So I wonder if you would be willing to talk yeah. a little bit about that. So um, as Chief Sustainability Officer, you'd imagine as the S, um, we believe in diversity, equity, inclusion. And so I'm a huge, I mean, obviously I'm a woman, so I'm gonna be all about women's economic empowerment because I can tell you my career hasn't always been easy as a woman in certain fields. Um, uh, thankfully, we have tons more he for she kind of champions out there. Um, but, uh, but I thought if I ever got to a position like I am now, I would make sure that I'm an advocate for um, more economic empowerment for underrepresented communities, including women. And on the S side of my ESG portfolio, we're obviously championing initiatives to try to provide economic empowerment, access to education, 
um, and the tools for particularly women-owned businesses or um, uh, minority uh, small and medium-sized businesses to be able to engage in trade. And, and yes, it's the right thing to do. But the way we've been able to move it within the company is through the business case. Uh, because the reality is we have to be um, mindful of our shareholders and that UPS is a for-profit entity. Um, we see it as good business to facilitate trade, to help companies cross borders, to expand their market access opportunities and help them grow their businesses. And so we do a lot of work for women's economic empowerment to help especially women-owned businesses learn about the tools that they need, understand the trade regime rules better, and then expand their uh, perspective on the market access for their products and services. And, um, and it's, it's a compelling business case when you think about a lot of the economic studies that have been done if we empowered more women uh, you could grow uh, global GDP by significant amounts um, and uh, and so we're saying to ourselves why is it that we only have a limited set of companies um, engaging in trade when we can be empowering so many more and we want to be part of that solution and hopefully be the logistics provider for them I will also say that uh, in addition to providing those tools and serving as um, business advisors to companies coming to us that want to expand their global footprint, especially the small and medium-sized businesses, we're also the big megaphone for them. Because as you can imagine, we have huge enterprise accounts, right? We, we ship uh, for Amazon, we ship for Apple, we ship for Nike, all the companies that have huge legal and trade uh, you know, uh, teams, and, um, and they can figure out the rules of trade. But it's the small and medium-sized businesses that sometimes don't have that champion or that advocate for when they're running across barriers. And so we try to be the voice of those small and medium-sized businesses at um, you know, uh, organizations like the World Trade Organization, be their voice in the bilateral or regional trade negotiations. And in fact, if you've noticed, and I'm really proud of the fact that UPS and my team specifically was at the intersection of the negotiation of a lot of the small, medium-sized business chapters that were included in the um, modernized uh, US Canada Mexico agreement were the ones who are pushing for advances in the WTO rules, eliminating the discrimination on the basis of gender within the uh, domestic regulation rules. By the way, you noticed I said gender, I didn't say sex. It's because I'm a huge champion of LGBTQ community. Um, they're discriminated against uh, significantly in global trade. We got the first ever language in the USMCA on gender, uh, you know, elimination of gender under discrimination there. We're doing it in the WTO because when UPS shows up, we can represent the interests of all those small and medium-sized businesses who, by the way, they're, they're, the, the CEO is usually the CFO, is usually the janitor, is usually the procurement officer. They don't have someone that can be out there talking about their issues. We try to be the voice for them because we believe if we can help eliminate the barriers for them, then maybe they can grow and hopefully they'll choose UPS because we'll provide the best value and service. So, Great. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the President's Advisory Board on mm -hmm. doing business in Africa? And I will share I, with you, um, I am up, like I've just submitted my application to continue to serve in that capacity. Um, it's one of the roles that I'm really the proudest of. And any of you that may do more research into my background, you know from my TED Talk that I um, am a firsthand witness to genocide, right? I served uh, in Kigali, Rwanda during the genocide, and I saw the worst of humanity, and I saw what happens when uh, society breaks down. and. Um, and it was a life-changing experience for me. And, and you know, all of my staff was killed but one. I live with that deep regret. Uh, obviously, almost a million people died. And I was one of the US government representatives that evacuated out while all those people died. So deep regret. Um, that I will always carry with me, but a commitment to do everything in my power to help um, prevent 
that kind of uh, you know situation again. And I think um, preventing the next genocide happens when you create a societies of equity and justice and promotion of prosperity. And um, from that perspective, I am someone who will always raise my hand to figure out how we address the challenge, the development challenges uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I believe um, it, you interact with any of the country's leadership or the people in these countries, they're not looking for handouts. They have dignity and respect. They're looking for opportunity and empowerment. And so in serving on the President's Advisory Council for doing business in Africa, it was an opportunity to um, champion ways in which uh, providing more of that economic empowerment through improved logistics supply chains and modernized customs policies would be a way that we could be helping those in each of these countries uh, find their own way forward rather than you know continuous handouts. And um, I've been uh, in the in the role now two terms. Uh, I was. Um, uh, nominated for it under the Obama administration, continued under the Trump administration, and am now in the process of hopefully, hopefully getting reappointed under the Biden administration. If I don't get reappointed, that's okay, because I'm still going to be a you know, loud voice in terms of what's needed to really foster economic empowerment across um, Africa, including you know, raising the health foundation of so many of these countries. It's why I'm like, anytime I get a request for um, facilitating movement of vaccines across uh, you know, the sub-Saharan African continent, I'm like, yes, and how quickly can we do it? But um, in the, uh, it, as co-chair, we've been trying to champion some of the policy changes that governments need to make, uh, talking with uh, the business community in all of those countries about the tools that they need to be able to be more successful within their own country, and then fostering the kind of unity and collaboration um, across the continent. Because the reality is, at the levels of development of much of their population, they're not going to have markets of scale until they start raising the standards of living um, within each of the, you know, the population base. And so fostering more regional coordination and cooperation is a powerful way to really advance economic development. Development. So, fingers crossed, um, I get reappointed. And if not, you'll still hear me talking all about the policies that are needed across Africa, because I believe it's the uh, continent that has the most opportunity for advancement and growth um, if the right resources and policy attention is given to it. So, could you, I don't want you to speak out of turn or confidence, but could you talk about some specific? policy, specific countries, yes. specific industries, where you see big opportunities yes. or big challenges? Yeah. yeah. I, and so I'm a, I am a power of positive person, So I, yeah. and I'm also a former diplomat, right? So I only speak in the positive terms. I can tell you all the frustrations privately with certain governments, but um, let me talk about the governments that um, are really thinking, are, are forward, forward thinking. thinking. Yep. Um, so Rwanda, obviously, uh, I, I recognize there are issues with, um, with some of the policy decisions that Kagame has made and the fact that there hasn't been a peaceful transition of power uh, necessarily because of this, what he believes to be not enough strength in the institutions. Putting that aside, the policy decisions that have been made in Rwanda have facilitated our ability to bring in the first drone service anywhere in the world in Rwanda. Why did that happen? Policy, smart policy decisions by the Rwandan government to facilitate our ability to move things cross border from a customs perspective and facilitate the utilization of drones in that country. Rwanda is the land of a thousand hills. And I'll tell you, they have one of the worst rainy seasons um, that you can imagine. Roads get washed out and they're you know, rising in level of development, but they're nowhere near um, in what I'd call you know, middle income. And uh, Kagame knows that. And he recognized that the health of his country would be the basis for greater economic uh, uh, you know, empowerment. And his health minister 
his trade minister, as well as his you know, industry and technology ministry, worked with us so that we could bring in the Zipline drone service that's now been used to decrease um, uh, uh, female mortality. Uh, uh, sad fact, um, one in three women would give birth in Rwanda and um, often not survive the childbirth because they couldn't get blood supplies, because the blood supply within Rwanda was compromised because two in three people were HIV positive or had other diseases. Long story short, we've been able to reverse that because we can now get supplies delivered through drones anywhere in that country in 15 minutes or less. It's a function of a partnership with government right policies being put in place. The beauty of our launching that service in Rwanda is guess what? Ghana said, hey, Laura, do you guys think you could bring that service here? And how beautiful that the initial conversations happened in 2019 that set the stage for us to bring that drone service into Ghana that's now being used to deliver those vaccines. Fast forward, Malawi now is talking to us and, and, and Nigeria now talking to us. Um, we're gonna be in the um, region that's controlled by Boko Haram. If you can imagine how, uh, if you ship supplies by ground, how um, you know armed groups could take those supplies and use them for other purposes. When you do it by drone, it's end to end and ensures the integrity of those supplies being shipped. Pretty excited about that. Um, it's again because governments made the had the political decision to say we are going to facilitate this innovation in our country. We're going to change the policies with respect to our customs rules, with respect to our technology, um, and with respect to our health ministries to come together to support this kind of advancement in our country. That's that's just one perfect example of when governments are on side with you in terms of how you need to do your logistics and they make it easier, not harder to do. Wow, amazing things happen. So, so, so is that commercially viable at this point? It or, is. Is it, or is it foundation? It's, it's, your foundation? It, it's a mix. So okay. um, there's times when we do it through uh, the foundation side, um, depending on uh, the specific needs in certain regions in the country. But uh, a lot of our vaccine deliveries in Ghana now are done um, with, uh, with commercial terms in mind. And, and let me just say, I mean, like I said, we are a for-profit company. Um, and so uh, I, I wish my foundation were able to solve all the problems of the world, but the foundation is only limited in its scope and its financial um, you know, uh, resources to be able to do so much. Um, but what we try to do is you know, show that we can do great things in difficult places um, and then work with governments on the right terms and conditions so that we are um, paying for those pilots that are flying the vaccines in, covering the cost of fuel and, and the drivers or the drone operators because they need to have a livelihood, um, and then uh, hopefully spreading the technology and the know-how so that um, these countries can develop their own cap capabilities in the process. Um, because um, we believe when you know, we share that knowledge and um, expertise, you know, the world benefits from it too. Well, you've confessed that you're a trade geek, and I am a trade geek, I know. as you know. <laughs> uh, so I wonder if you could reflect back a little bit about uh, WTO accession mm -hmm. and China. Yes. And what did you learn in that role? And, and has, that, has, that play, has that stuck with you? Uh, have you yeah. used things you've learned in that role uh, since then? Yes. Um, so the China negotiations were completely fascinating. Full disclosure, I was very pregnant at the time and um, I, uh, I learned to pace myself because um, I was carrying my first daughter at the time and um, I learned you do have to sleep. Uh, and uh, I think it created a better balance in who I was. Um, I don't know, becoming a mom kind of makes you recognize that there's lots of other important things in life rather than working 20 hour days. And I will confess I was doing that and that's not healthy. Um, Work-life balance matters. Um, 
The China negotiations, though, were fascinating because it was at a time when Zhu Ranji was trying to rethink uh, how the Chinese economy was going to work and thinking about the right policy environment that really would foster the most economic development and I would argue um, address some of the poverty that existed in a lot of the Western provinces. What would make China better able to provide for its huge population? And, um, you know, a lot of times in the media or in politics, we create enemies. We create an us versus them. In those negotiations, though, um, we developed partnerships and trust and recognition of each other's interests. Uh, and um, it's in the course of that negotiation I learned the power of win-win negotiating um, outcomes. Um, I think right now in our country and in the world, there's a lot of divisions. There's a lot of it's my way uh, or, um, you know, or it's not. And there's not efforts to foster unity. In the China negotiations, even though the U.S. and the, um, the WTO partners that were negotiating with the Chinese, we had all the leverage. By the way, we'd been negotiating with the Chinese for 20 plus years. Talk about a stroke of luck to come in the last two years in that negotiation. I'm like, oh, I'm here. We're ready to close the deal now. Um, but it was just the right timing when the Chinese and the U.S. were ready to find that common ground. I learned about the power of understanding the other side's interests and working with them to achieve their objectives rather than trying to close a deal at the expense of them. And it served me really well throughout my career because, um, as you can imagine now, in the world of politics, just you know, just down the street on Capitol Hill, there's a lot of red or blue. There's a lot of Republican or Democrat. And um, you, if you talk to any UPSer and how we advocate, we're not red or blue, we're brown. Because we advocate for policies that bring people together. Uh, and I think that was a lesson that I learned in the China negotiations. We weren't going to bring China into the WTO on terms that weren't also good for that administration that, uh, you know, the, the different policy objectives that they had. And that required really understanding the other side and fostering an agreement that ultimately brought more market terms to our engagement with the Chinese. Is it a perfect deal? No. Are there issues? In fact, that China is going through its WTO um, review right now and getting a lot of tough questions. Here's the reality, nothing's perfect, you know, the, the, and you have to keep going back and working on issues, um, and maybe that's the other part of it. You know, deals are moments in time, and you constantly have to be building to build better um, going forward, and you do that by bring, bringing people together and not by drawing sides. So. Great. So I'll ask one last question, and then okay. we'll open it up to the floor, because I'm sure that there are people out there with lots of questions. And maybe this will anticipate some of the audience's questions. But could you talk a little bit about, so you've had this phenomenal career that spanned government service and the private sector. Can you talk to us about your thinking as you kind of traversed yes. those various roles? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was sharing with Brad before. Um, so I grew up in Des Plaines, Illinois, right? Uh, did a little stint in, in West Germany because my dad got assigned there, but you know, totally homegrown girl and so wanted to see the world, but total idealist. Um, I was one of the youngest women ever admitted into the Foreign Service, and when I got into the Foreign Service, by the way, thanks to um, the MSFS program, I got to give a shout out to Ambassador Steigman, who would do these little um, classes here on campus on how to pass the Foreign Service exam, and I'm like, holy cow, I'm so glad I was at Georgetown because I passed it on the first try. But I sent a letter to my dad saying, I am going to go into the Foreign Service, and I am going to change the world, and I'm never going to sell out to corporate America and the man and and oh it was the most beautiful letter uh, that I wrote uh, as my 20 something self and I look back now and I'm like boy did I have a world of experience that I needed to get under my belt um, I still haven't lost that passion for making the world a better place I think I just have a little bit more sophisticated un understanding about what it takes to really make lasting positive change and it really does involve um, recognizing that 
the world and policies and how nations and people interact depend on a lot of different interests from a lot of different stakeholders. So it isn't just government that solves all the problems. It is often at the intersection of stakeholders like the investor community, like civil society, um, like the NGO community that's involved in advancing you know, initiatives with respect to certain issue areas. Um, it includes business. And by the way, business isn't monolithic, right? We're, uh, it's logistics, it's financial services, it's technology. Um, you have to understand all the different interests of all those different players and bring them together to advance uh, solutions for problems. If anybody thinks that climate change is going to be solved by governments, uh, you, you know, I, I think you're sadly mistaken because the reality is business is still operating. It's got to be done in partnership. And by the way, there's a lot of communities and uh, civil society organizations that are looking at some of the sustainability questions from a different lens that business, sometimes looking at it through the profit lens, needs to understand the implications of it, uh, of the effect of on, on communities and on people in different you know, uh, geos and um, from different uh, democratic, uh, de demographic kinds of levels. And so it's been a journey for me, honestly, um, and one that I was sharing with Brad. God, I wish there would have been a program like I understand Georgetown is creating that creates that intersection between business and public affairs in a really meaningful kind of way, because that's how the problems of today and tomorrow are going to be solved. Not by one, any one stakeholder group. It's going to be by all of them bringing their talents, their expertise, and the power that they wield in different settings to come together to um, address those problems. And so um, it's been a journey. I will share with you, I would love to go back into um, public service. I'm a civil servant at heart. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit of an odd duck, I recognize, on um, the executive leadership team because I'm differently motivated than maybe some of the others. Um, and I think it's a function of my Georgetown education and the belief that uh, you know, our role should be bigger in the world. Um, so I, I kind of feel like, thank God I'm the chief purpose officer because I get to bring that perspective um, into the executive leadership discussions about not just the important business decisions that we make, but how they can have that positive impact in the world, so. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're gonna open it up to questions from the floor. There's a microphone in the middle of the aisle in the back if you would be willing to step up and ask your question. Yeah, please. And, and the reason we're asking you to go to the mic is uh, for our friends who are online. That way they can hear your question. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and you can take your mask off. Okay. Um, I, I was just going to ask, you know, you mentioned that a lot of different groups need to come together for a solution on, on climate or society or whatever it may be. Uh, certain social issues. One of the things that seems to get in the way is that there's not a ton of respect, mutual respect between those two groups of kind of business leaders and and government leaders and you know say climate climate scientists or, or social activists. So um, you know, given that you have kind of a, a, a range of responsibilities and authority, what is your advice for getting those different stakeholder groups together and getting them to be able to work together in a way that is um, that does produce progress. Right. So um, it's going to sound cliche. We need more Hoyas uh, trained like like this, right? Because I need more allies, right? Um, I've got our CFO Brian Newman and our Chief Marketing Officer Kevin Warren, who are um, the you know two other members of the executive leadership team. And what's powerful is we think about things a lot in the same way. And so I think it is about finding and developing and cultivating more people with this kind of mindset because that's 
one part of the, um, uh, the solution, because sometimes I have been the only person in the room sometimes advocating another position or trying to be a bridge, and it's so much more powerful when you have more bridge builders with you. But in my role, um, I, I really do take it as a responsibility to bring those stakeholder groups. Um, UPS has a townhouse right off of Capitol Hill, and I can tell you I have convened more meetings um, with different kinds of stakeholders, strange bedfellows sometimes to talk about issues. Um, we're part of a really powerful group called the US Global Leadership Coalition, which is a, it's call, it calls itself the Strange uh, Bedfellows Coalition, which which brings former military leaders, business community, and civil society orga uh, organizations together around a table to talk about issues that we need to address. Um, and so uh, I think the more that that, th that kind of convening can happen, the more trust can be built. Um, I will tell you, you know, I, and I guess I learned this from the China negotiations, you know, before you sit across the table from them, you can believe what all the media says and that they are the enemy or whatever negotiation you're in until you sit across the table from them and you realize they are, um, you know, just like you uh, in terms of being part of one humanity. And when you start to talk to each other as individuals and understand aspirations, hopes, dreams, and interests, it changes the whole conversation. So the more we can foster those kinds of dialogues, the better. I will tell you we are one of the biggest champions for bringing Republicans and Democrats together. It's no accident that the infrastructure bill, for example, got bipartisan votes. We worked really hard to help Republicans see um, why they needed to partner with Democrats to address the fundamental challenges that we see uh, you know, across the United States with the state of our infrastructure, that that didn't have to be a Republican or Democrat issue. That was an American competitiveness issue. And we fostered those kinds of discussions because we purposely bring people together, have them eat together, have them talk to each other outside of the, the media limelight, which often results in people posturing rather than listening. And um, so uh, I think that's the solution. Does it happen enough? Unfortunately not. But um, I'm a big believer in uh, if not me, then who? So we try. And we keep trying to foster those kinds of dialogues and discussions. And um, when there is a lack of trust, I, I try to be the first to offer the olive branch to say, I know you have no reason to trust me, but here's what I have to say, and here's what I can do in partnership. So. Vanessa? Well, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm not in the new program, but I am an MSFS MBA dual degree, so definitely Can I just understand. say smart girl? Because I, I was telling Brad, you know, it's the biggest frustration for me. I wished I had a stronger business background, financial acumen. Because um, look at where I sit now, and I'm like, I have the most amazing CEO who is an incredible financial thinker, and I'm like, Damn it! I wish I were faster on those issues. So good for you for you know doing that kind of dual, dual degree program. Yeah. So that is actually a good segue into my question, which is a follow-on from what Professor Jensen was asking you. But my main thing would be like for someone like me, I have more of like the public sector background, more focused on policy. When you are making the transition from public to private. How did you market yourself to join? Because a lot of times when you look at the private sector, they're looking for very specific business background and mm -hmm. acumen. So you know, you came from being the diplomat into that private sector. So what, what kinds of things did you do to market yourself as somebody who can also be good in the private sector? And which of the skills in the private sector have you found that you most needed to grow on um, after being more on the policy side of things for a while? I'm gonna be totally honest with you guys. I never would have charted this career path. Um, sometimes it was being in the right place at the right time. Sometimes it was um, opportunity and saying, what the heck, what have I got to lose? Um, and uh, so I didn't, 
I haven't necessarily marketed myself, but I have advocated for what I bring to the table. And there's a difference because um, in each role that I've had, I wasn't looking for that next opportunity, but it, uh, it emerged because of the role that I was playing um, in whatever you know, position I was in. So um, coming back to the State Department, um, you know, uh, following the Rwandan genocide, I stayed long enough to give testimony to the UN War Crimes Tribunal and um, that's the reason I was in the State Department a little bit longer and really soul searching to say, oh my God, you know, I can't stay in the State Department because of a failure of US policy, but what do I do to stay true to what I believe I wanna see in the world? And kind of just raised my hand and said, can I go to the Economic and Business Bureau and maybe get involved in trade negotiations? So some of it was raising my hand and saying, I don't know anything about trade negotiations. I didn't know anything about trade. Let's just be real, nothing about trade other than what I learned at George Georgetown, but not enough to go into USTR. But raising my hand got me a seat at the table as the State Department representative on the basic telecom negotiations. And then you know what I did? I studied as hard as I could. I talked to everyone. I listened. I learned. Um, and that created the next opportunity for the position to be in, you know, recruited into USTR. And it's actually in the um, China negotiations that my name got known among the business community because I was the one representing their interests at the negotiating table. And, um, and so the skills I demonstrated were, um, commitment to advancing their interests and learning their interests, listening to what their problems were, not telling them what we were gonna do for them, but understanding the challenges that they were facing and brainstorming with them on the solutions that could be worked with the Chinese government. Um, and it's through that that I actually got the call to join AOL Time Warner. Um, and then, you know, I, I will share with you all, I, I was at Time Warner, absolutely loved it, loved working with Warner Brothers and HBO, as you can imagine, totally creative people that are so powerful in their storytelling. Never underestimate the power of storytelling to change policy, because if you can't get, you can't throw statistics and numbers, they're important, data matters, oh. data matters, data matters, I'm not under, but the power of a story to change hearts and minds. Um, and I learned that there. And um, the jump from Time Warner to Citigroup was um, because someone threw my uh, resume in the ring. And I'm going to tell you, the fabulous Nick Callio, who I worked for um, at Citigroup, I think I was his last resort because he'd interviewed all the big names, and I was not a big name. Um, and I just kind of went into the interview and just said, here's who I am, here's what I can do, and I, you know, you'll, you'll never get uh, less than 150%. I'll always work hard, I'll learn. I knew nothing about financial services other than insurance, and I remember you know, taking this tutorial about naked credit default swaps. I'm like, holy cow, how am I gonna learn all this stuff? Then comes the financial crisis, talk about the worst time to be at Citigroup, learned a lot there, um, and then I decided, you know what, I'm ready to take on a global role, and literally just put my resume out and said, it's not like I was looking, but I said I was ready. Uh, in other words, I put myself out there, and I interviewed for nine months at UPF to get into this UPS position. I, and I was always thinking I was the token outside candidate because it was a promote from within culture. And I think I talked to enough people uh, to finally get the opportunity and then ended up here. So long story short is it's raising your hand. It's demonstrating what you're doing in your current role. And the greatest skills I think are people skills networking, making sure people know who you are and what your skill set is. Um, great communication skills. You got to be able to write. You got to be able to communicate. And um, I'd say uh, a learning mindset. You know what I mean? I think it's a, it, it, it actually is a skill. You have to be open to always learning because you're never going to know everything no matter what role you're in. 
Um, and so I think those are the, I, I think the top three skills. Uh, the network is what has always gotten me the next opportunity, because it's people who've known me and known the quality of my work that said, hey, give her a shot. Carol Tomei offering me this position. I, I knew her from the board, but didn't know her on a personal level. But she saw me in action, and enough people talked to her about the skills that I would bring. And, I, and I've been given this incredible opportunity to, because of it. So is that, right. does that answer the question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Everybody wants to get to the reception? Yeah. Oh, no. Here we go. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. I have a quick question. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so it sounds like your career has been amazing, and you went on different journeys and took on different roles. Uh, one of the things you said was, you know, if not me, then who? Um, I think one of the things that, you know, we're, some of us are pretty early on our career track, and we feel that, you know, we might not have as big of a sphere of influence as your current role. So any advice for us on yeah. making a difference even when you feel like you don't have as big of a sphere of influence? Can of. I tell you, I tell my team this all the time. Do you guys know how old I was when I led the evacuation of innocents out of Rwanda? I was 26 years old. Um, I was the junior officer. I was not the ambassador. I was not the DCM. I was nothing. I was a second tour junior officer. If I would have told myself, and by the way, I had that you know internal soundtrack in my head going, well, I, I, I can't be the one that makes it to the embassy and makes all these decisions. I'm not the ambassador. And then in, in that moment, I realized, if not me, then who? And um, you know, worked my way through the lines of fighting and figured out how to begin negotiating the ceasefires. I will tell you, um, when we got into Burundi and I met with the commanding officer, um, he looked at me and he said, you could be my granddaughter. And I'd say, sir, I'd be really proud to be your granddaughter. But right now, I'm the person who knows everything about Rwanda and what do you need to know. Um, so my answer to you is never let your um, years of experience, your level, your title dictate the impact that you can have. I tell every single person on my team, from the ones just out of college to the ones that have been there 15, 20 years, I empower you to be the difference you want to see in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that you, have, that you are so arrogant to think that you know it all. You obviously want to work with others to make sure that as you're in advancing a, a particular position, you've consulted and coordinated with others, but be the change you want to see in the world. Be the leader in whatever position you are. You'd be surprised how many people will follow when the idea is good and the, um, the principle and values behind it are shared. Um, anybody can make that difference. And when you believe that, you'll be surprised. You don't need to be the CEO of a company. You don't need to be a chief corporate affairs officer. You can be a supervisor on the front line of our operations who we try to laud every day, make those calculated decisions to make a difference in the moment, and they can lead uh, anywhere. And so I just say to you, use what you've got. Keep learning along the way. And if you see a problem, be someone that just doesn't whine about it, come with three solutions, find ways to find allies, and then try to see what works. When it fails, by the way, fail forward, not, um, not uh, get discouraged. I have failed throughout my career millions of times. And what I've done every single time is I've got myself back up. I said, OK, what did I learn from this? How am I going to not make that mistake again? And then just keep advancing. So lead from wherever you are. You don't have to have a title. So. Terrific yeah. advice. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, please. That'd be great if you would. Oh. No, you can just say it. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's Could you take, uh, yeah, sure. oh, uh, that way I can hear you better. So. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Lang, for your wonderful speech. Um, I have two questions. So, firstly, I, I knew you had extensive experience on, in di uh, diplomatic life. So I'm curious about your perspectives on the relationship between China and the U.S. at mm -hmm. this current moment. Mm -hmm. So actually, the relationship between these two economies has evolved um, since 
of the beginning of the Nixon administration mm -hmm. um, and to um, Clinton to George W. Bush, and it has been counted ups and downs. So I'm curious about your perspectives on how this relationship will evolve under Biden administration or possibly um, in the future. And secondly, um, I would also love to learn, um, I know in uh, politics life, uh, it's a male-dominant mm -hmm. yes, um, industry, and now in the C-suite level, and definitely I assume there will be more males than female leaders. So how did you manage to climb up to this ladder, mm -hmm. and what are some of your advice and suggestions? Yeah. So um, in terms of the China relationship, I look at it like the Chinese do over a long period of time. There's going to be ups and downs. And um, I think the efforts are underway to try to get China to be part of some of the solutions for the global challenges that we face. I will share with you that UPS, for example, is working with the State Postal Bureau on figuring out ways to create more green logistics solutions because the climate challenges that China faces just within its territorial borders notwithstanding the fact that they obviously uh, affect the global warming situation. Um, we try to look for partnerships with them. And I know that this administration is looking for ways to find shared um, uh, oppor uh, shared opportunities, while at the same time asking that the rules that are um, you know, internationally recognized be followed. And I think there are instances, both with US actions as well as Chinese actions, where the rules aren't always being followed. Um, sometimes it, the argument's made that it's in, the in national security interests. Sometimes it's made for uh, national economic interests. And um, so I, I suspect that the relationship is going to continue to have the ebbs and flows because we still operate in a nation state world where those national security and national economic interests will often clash. Um, and um, my hope is that companies can serve as bridges for finding shared interests uh, and that the people-to-people -people exchanges can foster greater understanding. Um, and so I am actually a big advocate for that kind of, those kinds of exchanges because I think when you understand people from a more personal perspective, you foster trust and greater understanding and that can translate into opportunities for governmental shared you know, uh, policy objectives. Do I think that we're always going to see eye to eye? No. Uh, I hope we never come to the point where the differences become such that they have to spill over into more um, militaristic responses. Uh, it's why I was a big champion of China joining the WTO, even if the deal isn't as perfect as it could have been. Because I believe when you trade and you do business with one another, you establish a basis for trust. And that can be the foundation for more peace and opportunity. I'm hoping that there is always an effort to foster those kind of economic collaborations. And through those economic collaborations, I actually think we have the opportunity to address some of the global challenges that we're seeing, including climate change. I India and China, biggest you know, economies in the world, biggest populations, we want them on side in terms of solving those problems with us. So we're trying as a company to be bridge builders there. In terms of being in a career, a, a, a variety of different career settings that were male dominated, I'm going to tell you that it wasn't women that helped me along the way. In fact, I will tell you throughout the course of my career, it was often women that worked against me because they were one of the few and you know, not wanting to have necessarily more competition. It was always, I, I can name them all, it was always he for she champions within these organizations that I served in. Um, I joined the Foreign Service uh, after men and women brought a class action lawsuit against the State Department because they used to discriminate against women if they got married or pregnant because they didn't want them on the front lines of diplomacy. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you want women on the front lines of diplomacy given that perspective? But it was, you know, because of that lawsuit, it was great men along the way who supported me in my career. Go into Time Warner. By the way, Time Warner um, and the entertainment industry known for all the sexual harassment. And I'll tell you, throughout my career, I've faced a, a lot of it. Um, uh, being measured by 36, 24, 36, rather than the, you know, my ideas or 
um, uh, you know, the power of uh, the initiatives I'm trying to advance. But there again, it was great men who stood by my side and said, uh, she's, you know, she should be an equal at the table. Great people like Nick Calio at Citigroup, who sometimes I would walk into financial services rooms and it was mostly all men. And I'd walk in and they'd ask me if, um, if I could get them a cup of coffee and if I was going to be taking notes. And I said, happy to get you coffee, um, but you'll be the one taking notes because I'll be the one presenting. Um, and so uh, look, fast forward to UPS, uh, really male dominated. Um, uh, company because women traditionally haven't gone into the logistics or trucking um, business uh, and we're trying to change that perspective with great men you know demonstrating we need women engineers we need uh, women IT professionals by the way women make some of the greatest truck drivers um, and showing that it's possible and so throughout my career it's been having those champions mostly males um, helping me uh, be recognized for being ready for those next opportunities. And I think it's also been a little bit of never having a chip on your shoulder about it and not walking in a room as the only woman in the room, but walking in the room with the one with the best ideas uh, and um, creating the base of allies to support me in whatever initiative I was trying to advance. So it's kind of a two-way street. Um, and um, I'm a big believer that we're going to do this together. We're going to create more opportunities for underrepresented groups in our society when we become allies for each other. And that includes awesome he for she people like, you know, uh, Professor Jansen. You know, so um, uh, so hopefully that's answered your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that was fantastic, Laura. Good. It was. Everything I expected. Good. Um, mm -hmm. Please join me in thanking Laura. So we're adjourned. We're adjourned. Thank you. Have a good evening. Peace. And I'd love to answer any other questions, you know, in the reception. Uh, maybe if you didn't feel comfortable asking them publicly, I'm happy to answer them privately. Great. Great. Thank you. Great.